why do we not need to talk about ADHD with a focus on children? What do our listeners need to know? Well, ADHD in children is really important. You don't have to have a diagnosis. Your child doesn't need to have gone through the process of getting that diagnosis to get help. Because what I really, really want to stress is ADHD is a bunch of symptoms labelled. So the symptoms are the thing that we want to try to get to the root cause of. If we can understand why you might be feeling the way that you're feeling, your child's feeling the way they are, then you're more likely to get them into a place where they aren't affected as badly by the symptoms of ADHD. Nice, like that. And what are some of those symptoms that you're seeing in children? Because sometimes children present a bit differently to adults, don't they? Where parents might be like, okay, I think there's something potentially neurodiversity going on. Uh, What are some of those symptoms that parents might see in their children that might make them think either, yes, I want to explore diagnoses, but diagnosis is just a word. Sometimes it helps with extra time in exams. But actually more what they might want to do is use those symptoms to come see you to get some support. So what are those symptoms? And then we'll go into what the support might be. Well, the symptoms that you generally can see in children are like disorganised nature, can't manage to remember things where they're pulling their books together and they know they've got class on this different things. They need five different books. They need to remember their PE kit. Um, So the organisation side of it. I think comes really apparent when they're not just in primary school and sitting in one classroom. When the school gets bigger, the demands get more, you generally can see children struggle more because they are expected to remember certain things and organize themselves. So that is a symptom that we find quite a lot. And then other symptoms are things like lack of focus, lack of attention. So my wonderful kids and teens that I see on my Zoom clinic meetings, the kids can often just be going like, I'm <laughs> I'm just disappearing off. I'm looking at something different. And I can see that again in a classroom scenario, which is unless you are constantly trying to gain their attention back, the focus is really gone after a very short amount of time. Might come back. It doesn't always mean they're not listening. It can mean that they just need to focus on something different. Yeah, And there's almost like either a hyper focus where I'm really focused on something I really enjoy and I can build a whole Lego set because I love it. Or I can't do certain things because I haven't got enough focus to do that. Yeah. And you don't always have to have the hyperactive side of it. So, again, lots of parents can go or even, you know, sometimes kids can be like, yeah, but I'm not hyperactive. So I don't feel like that's a problem. And you don't have to be hyperactive to have like an ADD or ADHD. The hyperactive part could be more like my brain can be hyperactive towards certain things or I can't sleep itchy legs or uh, I can't sit still and I need to fidget. So there are different forms of how kids, teens can present all under the same bracket of ADHD. Yeah, yeah. And actually, how many of those children are just getting told off with come on, just remember, just, 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 you should just be able to do this versus being given strategies. Okay, so what can you do? Because actually, even when these children, teens, young adults have a diagnosis, yes, medication is an option for ADHD, which it's not for ASD, um, but many parents don't want to go down the medication route and medication does come with side effects, like it can really affect appetite um children are wanting to eat in their school day and therefore have another reason why they can't concentrate so what would you do as an expert in adhd in your clinic either from an investigative point of view or an implementation point of view yeah so i've got a fellowship in adhd meaning i'm trying to understand the whole picture as to what's going on with these children and teens because yes you can look at medication but medication is generally just trying to overrule a symptom what we do is more going, is there blood sugar dysregulation? Because that will affect your focus. Is there nutrient deficiencies? Because things like zinc, B6, incredibly important for your brain to function, for enzymes to function. Is there a histamine dysregulation? Because histamine is a neurotransmitter, which if you are low in zinc and B6, that's dysregulating your histamine. Can we look at if there's any food sensitivities? Because you'd be surprised how many people have food sensitivities and ADHD, but might not even know it. The research out there says when you do an elimination diet, for example, 50% of those with ADHD symptoms get, other way around, start that again, 80% of individuals with ADHD symptoms can get 50% at least better. 
just by through just out those highly just rich through foods. an elimination diet. Now, I'm not a lover of elimination diets from a take stuff away. I actually rather putting food in. But if we're looking at nutrient deficiencies, we need to put the foods in to get those nutrients up. If we're looking at histamine intolerances, we need to take some of those histamine, high histamine foods out but get the gut working so that you can break down the histamine, get the DMI, D, DAO enzyme working properly. And then I'm all for there are parts of food which are not medicine. Food is medicine or it's hindering you. And the part of the elimination diet that I really like is get the processed food out. With help, I will help you with that because a lot of these kids are really addicted to carbs and to gluten dairy and sugar and it's very difficult to get that out and we do lots and lots of swaps and gentle maneuvers around what is um making a child not unhappy to take out but more like okay let's do waffles which are made of good proteins and not gluten and not processed sugar you're still getting something yummy but it's a better way of putting it in so the way we work is what is going on in this person's body and this person's brain whether it's gut Partly genetics, which we can understand more and how we can support your genetics, understand neurotransmitters, understand food and sensitivities as to what is going on in this individual. So like 99% of our genetics has not changed in 10,000 years. But why has all of our brains been affected, our autoimmune conditions, our immune systems, our gut dysregulating, knock on trip? There are things going on in our world that our genetics are being based in, which is making our children and our teens really struggle from an ADHD perspective. Yeah, love it, love it. So if we're trying to keep this short, snappy, uh, what one thing can our listeners go, I can start that today? Essential fatty acids. Get fats into your children because your brain is made up of 70% fat. And if you don't provide enough fat, which most children and teens are not eating enough fat, your brain is effectively starving. So if we then go, again, lots of research out there which supports the indication of ADHD symptoms improving when you put essential fatty acids in, which looks like more nuts, as long as no intolerances, seeds, get in those flax seeds, make chia seed pudding, if you can get them eating any sorts of oily fish, salmon, make them into a fish cake so that they don't hopefully taste it as much and go, I don't like that. Avocado into smoothies, using olive oil drizzled on top of cooked veggies. Essential fats are essential for brain health. I love it. And then, of course, I would imagine you recommending a, a good quality fish oil supplement would be a very quick thing for you to get Absolutely. started on when they come and see you in clinic. Absolutely, yes. So what we know from what you're telling us is there's investigation that can be done and this is beyond what is my diagnosis. There's the opportunity to dig into the root causes of them as a specific individual. And there's things that you can take away from appointment number one that actually gives parents and young people tangible, uh, proactive things that they can implement to make a difference to their kids, to their futures. I mean, that's massive. That's absolutely massive. That's holding their hand and encouraging them to walk up Mount Everest, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, sadly, nobody else has those skills in mm. our NHS, in our psychology services, in our OT services to be able to help these young people. Yeah. And that's the difference, isn't it, between pharmaceutical, you have a symptom, let's give you a pill. And I'm not saying that that can't work for people, but this, what we do, this is personalized medicine, meaning I am taking you as an individual. What is your body going through and how have you got to here? Let's test. Let's get those understandings. People come to me and they've already sort of Googled, like, what, you know, what can we do? I've heard about these tests, an organic acids test. Let's look at neurotransmitters. Let's look at your gut microbiome. Let's look at if there's any toxins going on. Let's look at your genetics or genomics and see how we can support your genomic response, but like response to the environment as to what's going on to make you then into a place that your body can work for you. Love it. Thank you so much, Lottie. Let's share, share, share. This is ADHD Awareness Month. If you're a parent of a child that has neurodiversity, it isn't limited to one month of the year. They are symptoms, areas your child struggles with for 12 months of the year. We need to keep raising awareness. Thank you so much for your time, Lottie, and thank you to all of our listeners.